this one is um, it's called a dire miscalculation. And of course, I'm just going to read an excerpt. I had rescued Sunny in the Cairo airport, a tall, lanky, blonde and blue-eyed South Australian. Like me at the time, he was in his mid-twenties. Unlike me, he didn't have six months under his belt living on the mean streets of a semi-developing country. He lacked my experience dealing with belligerent, pestering touts. Like hyenas sensing a kill, a mob had surrounded him, recognizing a perfect victim to drag to the hotel or store or wherever else would reward them with a handsome bounty for his head. Without giving a second of thought, without giving it a second thought, I broke through the chaos, grabbed Sonny by the hand, and took him with me to a cab. Shell-shocked and grateful, he offered no resistance. That was a week earlier. We'd been traveling together ever since. Making our way south, we had arrived in Luxor. Although tempted to go all the way to Aswan, we opted instead to catch a Faluka. Is someone trying to get in? Is that Diane again? Oh no, it's, 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 the, uh, it's a trash kit. All right. Making our way south, we had arrived in Luxor. Although tempted to go all the way to Aswan, we opted instead to catch a Faluka, a wooden sailboat traditionally used on the Nile to head back north. Now we were sailing on the Nile, the same Nile we heard so much about as children in Sunday school. The mythic river that had sustained an entire nation, not to mention ancient civilizations before it, turning sandy desert shores into fertile countryside. A river bordered by, bordered by celebrated pyramids, temples, and tombs, inhabited by crocodiles almost as legendary. A river that even now, from our perspective in the middle of it, seemed to flow through a time and place all its own. The shores were often covered with lush vegetation, grasses, bushes, and small trees crowding each other for access to the water. In other places, there was nothing but sand. Sometimes there were flat fields, sometimes steep mountains. Towering palms were common, entire stands of them occasionally sheltering dwellings made of adobe. Again, I was reminded of biblical times. As far as I could tell, the simple earthen structures were built in the same manner as they had been for millennia. The same might have been said for our Faluka. For all its charm, it did not have a toilet. We, therefore, did not have a choice. If we had to go, we had to stop. Besides being ecologically irresponsible, defecating over the side of the boat would have been challenging at best, dangerous at worst. It was also likely to seriously piss off some crocodiles. <laughs> Under ordinary circumstances, we could have gone several hours without relieving ourselves. As is so often the case when traveling, however, these were not ordinary conditions. Upon my arrival in Turkey many months earlier, I had suffered through 16 days of diarrhea. It hadn't been pretty exactly. The upside was that I now had a gut made of steel, or almost. Apparently Egypt had introduced some new microbes into my system, and while not as vicious as those I had encountered in Turkey, they had nonetheless loosened things up. Limited vegetarian options on the road hadn't helped, particularly given that one of my dietary staples was figs. On the boat, we were practically living on them. Fresh, healthy, high-fiber figs. It was sort of like binging on laxatives when we should have been guzzling emodium. Neither Sunny nor I wanted to be responsible for asking our hosts to pull over. After all, pulling over a sailboat on a river that's an average of two miles wide is a little more involved than pulling a car over to the side of the road. We were in the middle of nowhere. We couldn't just stop at the nearest dock. They were few and far between. An unspoken high-stakes brinkmanship ensued. Sonny and I each worked hard to disregard our respective needs in the hopes the others would become unbearable first. Sweat soon covered my brow. It wasn't the desert heat. It was evidence of my silent suffering. It was the fear of a familiar rumbling on my insides, a foreboding like an approaching storm. It was mounting anxiety as I strained to hear signs of similar distress coming from Sonny's gut, praying his would shortly become more intolerable than my own. It was grave concern for a sphincter past, fast approaching its limits. The tension of sitting on a powder keg about to blow without knowing when. It was futile resistance to a truth that could no longer be ignored. This was not going to end well. I don't remember who finally gave in. But I do remember, as far as Sonny and I were concerned, our little Faluka couldn't get to shore fast enough. The proud white sail, hearkening back to another time, now became a disturbing reminder we were almost out of it. I would have given anything to dispense with tradition and throw the engine into full throttle. But there wasn't a throttle, or even an engine. 
<laughs> so, our reunion with dry land, dry land happened in torturous slow motion. My innards a bubbling cauldron, my sphincter a gasket about to blow. Scarcely had we touched sand, then Sonny and I were off the boat, each scrambling in different directions in search of some privacy. We had stopped in a wild area of small dunes and clumps of tall grasses. There was no agriculture, no dwellings. My feet were buffered by the soft ground, but there was still the inevitable impact each time they fell upon it. I had only run a short distance when I knew I was in trouble. I'd been on the verge for too long. It was a miracle my body had withstood the pressure for as long as it had, deluding myself into thinking I could do so while running, no matter how short the distance, was a dire miscalculation. As I desperately scanned the environs for a place to relieve myself, my foot came down on the sand just a little too hard. That was all it took. My sphincter lost its grip, and I lost my race against time. And that's not the whole story, but that gives you an idea. 